Hello and welcome to the Unpruned Interview. My name is Sarah Brown and this is a series of garden organic interviews where we let our guests chat at length on subjects which are close to their hearts. Often the topic is too important or too riveting for us to press the edit button. In gardening terms you could say we're happy to leave their words unpruned. Our guest this month is Charles Dowding. Charles is an experienced organic grower and a great advocate of the no-dig technique. Many of you may have heard him talk in our May podcast. This is an extended version of that interview, where we give Charles a chance to talk about how he got started and what he uses as a deep mulch. We get down into the soil life and the fascinating process by which plants get their nutrients. With Charles explaining everything, you'll not hear a better, simpler explanation of why you shouldn't give up the spade and let the mulch do the work. But before we start, I'd just like to thank our sponsors, Viridian Nutrition. Viridian are the leading brand of ethical vitamins. They're passionate about sustainably sourced ingredients and have one of the largest ranges of organic vitamins and supplements. For them, it's all about purity, potency and provenance, with every product containing only 100% active ingredients. Find out more at viridiannutrition.com. That's Viridian with a V hyphen nutrition.com. So here I am in the wonderful lush Somerset countryside and I'm here with Charles, a passionate advocate of no dig technique. Morning, Charles. Morning, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me. It's a wonderful scene outside. I can see very many busy beds going on and piles of of black gold. Um, For the listener who really doesn't know what no dig technique is, can you... Just explain simply. Yeah, it's about not disturbing the soil at all and allowing all the life organisms in the soil to do their work without interruption or damage and about feeding them. So, okay, let's go right back. Why would someone dig the soil in the first place? Uh, Because they've been led to believe, they mistakenly believe that they're improving soil structure by introducing air and allowing water to drain and also by incorporating organic matter like compost into the rooting zone. I'm paraphrasing there i don't believe any of that yes (laughs) but that's as i understand it why people feel they have to or need to dig but using the no dig technique you can do exactly the same but without digging tell tell the listener how well i wouldn't even put it quite like that i wouldn't say exactly the same you're doing it better because soil organisms can build a much better structure than we can create with a four core spade which makes what i would call a mechanical tilth as opposed to a stable firm structure and actually, that leads to one of the fascinating bits about no dig, which is that you can walk on your beds. So I'm probably shocking some listeners right from the beginning here. Well, you are, because we're all <laughs> taught not to, because it compacts the soil. Exactly. You? Um, well, it only does that if you've previously damaged the structure by digging. It's about looking at things in a really different way in the end. But having said that, the essence of no dig is, is so simple. It's about just leaving the soil undisturbed and allowing soil life to flourish. And the feeding mechanism that you use, the organic matter mulch that you use, and will depend on your situation, what's available to you. I find for best vegetable growth, compost works really well. And of course, the organic way anyway is to feed the soil and not the plant. Exactly. It's a great way of thinking about things and this also leads to further simplifications that so much of what i'm developing as a method is is about saving time and doing it more simply and being able just to simply understand what what you're doing so feed the soil great and, and it means i put compost on all my beds every year whatever i'm going to grow i'm not thinking in terms of heavy feeders or light feeders as we have previously been taught to to believe and that that leads then into the I'm not doing a four-year rotation. You know, one thing leads on to another. We'll come on to those technical points in a minute. But yes, that's very interesting. So again, back to square one. What are you feeding the soil with? Well, I use compost now pretty well exclusively. When I started out, I came across this book by an American lady called Ruth Stout. And it had the delightful title, No Work Gardening. So, of course, it was a great bestseller. Her approach was using hay because her husband was a farmer and he had bales of old spoiled hay he couldn't use. And so she oh, put this on the garden. I'm bypassing the cow here. Why not use that as a mulch directly on the soil? And she got great results. Did wrote, she wrote, not get a lot of grass seeds growing? Oh, wow. This is where it gets interesting because uh, basically I, I didn't look too much into those kinds of details. But she was so passionately saying it was great that I in my first year 1982 I bought a a lorry load of old hay and uh, I used that as my mulch put it on the ground 
And then at the following spring, what things I planted like Brussels sprouts and lettuce, they kept being eaten by slugs. <laughs> so, oh, no. so I went back to the book. And, oh, why doesn't she say anything about slugs? You know, obviously mulches of hay. It's not a good idea. And then I realised she's in Connecticut. It's a dry climate, cold winters, hot summers, and, and they don't seem to have slugs. So that taught me about using appropriate mulches. And for any of your listeners, you know, some might be in different countries or wherever, you know, you, you have to adjust it to your climate. But if your climate is damp, slugs can be a problem with undecomposed mulches. That's the essence of it. And your compost is homemade compost. I prefer to use that because I find it has a better life profile, if you like. Loads of microbes in the homemade compost. If you, I do buy some, particularly in the start-up phase, when I want to make the soil really fertile from the beginning, I kind of look on it as a, a long-term investment in compost. So I'll put more on in year one. And then the subsequent dose, I can, I'm now actually pretty well able to make as much as I need. That's about six times a year. Um, but to do that, I am bringing in some materials from elsewhere, like coffee grounds and these. Okay, and what about farmyard manure? Because I think you Great. have used that before. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, in previous times, I bought farmyard manure, well rotted horse or cow. Um, I'm not too fussy, really. It's all good stuff. Um, and also, then the green waste compost and mushroom compost. If you've got leaf mould, that counts as compost. You know, when I use the word compost, it's anything decomposed. Right, that, that soil life can get hold of within exactly. the soil and convert to nutrients. Exactly, that's an interesting point that you make there because, you know, how much is understood or commonly understood about how plants feed? And we've been led, I would say, by the fertiliser industry to think in terms of soluble nutrients, you know, like the plant roots are there like a mouth, you know, there comes the nitrogen gulp and it goes in and it's much more complicated than that, I'm Absolutely, sure. Absolutely, yes. And from what I've read and what I observe, you know, conclusions is it's soil life eating organic matter and then excreting it, like worm cast is the most visible sign of that. And that's where all the goodness is. And it's not so much about soluble nutrients as somehow um, something that the plants can eat through interactions via fungi, yeah. you know, the fungal networks that we now hear a lot about and previously were never discussed. Yes. You know, and they're obviously damaged by any kind of soil cultivation. And that, that, when I started that growing, that was just not mentioned at all. Yes, that's so true. And most of that life is in the top part of the soil, isn't it? The top Absolutely. six inches, 25 yeah. centimetres or whatever. Yeah. So, so if, if you're you... going to put a spade through it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I would say even a broad fork. You know, people class no diggers, they include broad fork as no digger. And I would say no, you know, I wouldn't actually, because you are damaging. I've got a, stra- a trial over there where I'm doing three strips side by side and one is no dig and one is four. Forked. We just use a garden fork once or twice a year. And the fork strip yields about 5% less over five years so far. So that's just an example. OK, so we're talking about soil and feeding the soil. And of course, there's many different types of soil. I assume that your technique, the no-dig technique, works whether you have clay, sandy soil or whatever. Yeah, in fact, I've had experience of quite a range of soil. So I can say from experience that I started out on Cotswold brush, very stony soil and had good results there and then of course that was back in the 80s and people were asking more oh, but this wouldn't work on clay and I, well, I don't know for sure because I, I haven't done it anyway I then moved to France and farmed out there for a while and had a really horrible white sticky clay that it was the main reason we were able to buy our farm in fact because none of the local farmers wanted it and um, yeah no dig worked really well on that again and now here I'm on a kind of heavy silt it's a really nice soil but it certainly works on that. I, I see no reason why it doesn't work on any soil. And then now there's a whole range of people doing it on all different ones because it's the same principle, feeding soil life. And clay, you know, that it's unfortunate that it's still said in some quarters that you have to dig it first. You absolutely don't. You know, most soil has already got a structure. And particularly if it's growing lots of weeds, that's a really good sign. <laughs> yes, yes. And also you're helping with that whole water holding of clay aren't you yep. stopping it getting waterlogged and yep. the same with the fine sandy soil you're helping build it up so it can hold water totally i've got some followers in florida actually who seem to be on a from what they describe a very sandy soil and both of them have been saying fantastic results with no dig compost on top of sand pretty much and that is by i suppose it's the organic matter that's in the soil that's helping the structure of the soil but it's also those filaments of the fungi that we've been talking about as well yeah and i think everything is held in place better so you're getting more value out of the organic matter that you put on you know not incorporate it's actually better let the soil organisms do that and they build it in a more stable enduring form into the soil and i love this image of the filaments of the fungi and the roots of the plant they're Mm. very similar in appearance aren't they they seem to be holding it all together yeah between yeah very stable 
So again, let's go back to somebody <clears throat> who is first starting out thinking, I want to do no dig. I think this makes mm. sense. I have a small garden. I won't be able to access a lot of compost initially. Mm -hmm. How do they get started? Thank you, Charles. Well, one thing we need to mention is weeds at this point, because probably you're starting with weeds. So that's where I advocate laying cardboard. This is just as a one-off. Um, lay cardboard on your weeds and compost on top. And if you could get a minimum of, say, 10 centimetre, 4 inches compost on the cardboard, you could tread it down because the compost wants to be firm. And so implant into that the day you make it, if you want. You haven't got to wait for any of the weeds to die underneath or for the cardboard to decompose because it will decompose <clears throat> by the time your plant roots get down there. So I would advocate, you, I mean, you say, you know, someone who hasn't got access to a lot of compost, just buy some. It'll be the best investment. So this is the stuff that you buy in a garden centre in a plastic bag? Well, yeah, that's the, that's the um, the smallest way of buying, it, I suppose. And if you've got a, a garden where you need to carry stuff in, then, yeah, you'd have to buy it in a sack, I'm afraid. I don't know any other way than that. And if I you, assume it would be peat-free. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, there's absolutely no need for peat in any form or fashion. So it, it could be multi-purpose compost, um, mushroom compost whatever another source of course of compost is is green waste have you used that this is municipal compost isn't it yeah and it it needs a bit of understanding and how they've made it they, they tend to get it really hot and this would be included in the PAS 100 certification which doesn't mean it's organic it just means it's been properly composted it's this is the green waste collection that people have from door to door the local yeah. council will collect it put it into a large composting yeah or um, private companies it might be who and uh, and it's also stuff people take to the, the dump as it used to be called now called the recycling center yeah. and yeah it's great compost but what you need to know is that it's quite often delivered or sold when it's not ripe or ready and the difficulty with it is that it looks black and crumbly almost from day one because they chop it up into such small pieces and then get it hot very rapidly by turning it say every three days or whatever which feeds the bacteria in there with oxygen and then they get it really hot and so it breaks down very fast but it's still I've had loads delivered here where it comes off a lorry and it's steaming still and if you spread it um, on your ground and plant into something like that, that's what's called unripe, and that's where this thing of burning roots comes from. And it's not literally burning, because it's often not hot by the time you plant, but it's it's taking goodness for its own decomposition. How long would you leave it then, would you recommend? Well, if it was hot like that, I find two or three months is good. Okay, and but it's a good source, isn't it, of recycling? Exactly, it's great. Uh, yeah, it's recycled. It's fantastic organic matter. I think what it doesn't have is a lot of microbes, because they've got it so hot. But I reckon by the time you... Sp if you use it in a thin layer, just as a surface mulch, the microbes will get in there then. Yeah. Um, that's why I like using it with a bit of that and a bit of my homemade compost. Following that technique of putting down the mulch or putting down the cardboard mm. and then the mulch on top mm -hmm. seems to work very well. When you have a patch of grass and you think, mm -hmm. I'd like to convert that mm -hmm. grass into growing vegetables. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it definitely does. I mean, I'm getting fantastic feedback now, particularly through social media, and people saying, you know, the wonderful results they've been getting using this approach and marvelling at how simple it is. And you don't need a large area, do you? Exactly. I know I'm, we're surrounded here by yeah. your beautiful home home acres and all yeah. the beds and trials that you're doing, but actually you can do it on quite a small space. Yeah, I mean, this is a quarter acre here of cropped ground and I'm selling over £20,000 worth of vegetables every year from it, to give yes. you an idea. Yes. Whereas over there, for example, I've got a, 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 one trial bed, it's about two metres by 1.2, uh, so four feet by seven feet. And on that, I grow a range of vegetables, an amazing amount of food just on that one bed. Yes. And uh, five years ago, we had just put a wooden frame on the ground, on the grass, filled it with compost, about two thirds of a ton that was of compost. But since then, we've hardly needed any because we firmed it. We actually walked on it. It was trod the compost down really firm. That's not the same as compact. You know, firm, firm is good. And then that meant there was a lot in there and it, it just holds its shape, basically. And all I do is put on about less than an inch a year just to keep the level topped up. I want to keep it brimful. And that, that's a way of just maintaining um, soil life in good form. And we just keep cropping, you know, plant, 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 twist out, plant, twist out, and, and you just plant and plant and plant. And of course, the beauty of that is that if you're starting right at the beginning like that, mm. you probably don't have a compost heap. But mm -hmm. as you grow and as yeah. you pull your vegetables, you will yeah. almost inevitably have some wastage, won't you, of, of the leaves or the stems or whatever. Throw them on the compost heap. Yeah, absolutely. Everything, including weeds. Within well, a year, you will be self-sufficient, possibly, in compost. Well, not from just one bed, but yeah, from the rest of your garden, hopefully. It depends what you've got. 
some people, if you haven't got a big space and maybe you've got, all you've got in your garden is a bit of gravel in one bed or, you know, then you won't make a large amount of compost. But if you get in the habit of scrounging, now there's a lot of raw materials out there. Um, paper's really good to compost, for example. Yes. And um, leaves, some um, um, neighbours' rubbish they don't yes, want. Or, yeah. or even ripped up bits of cardboard. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. Well, composting, as our listeners will know, is dealt with in depth in the Garden Organic website. So it's good. worth going and having a look there. We also on the website talk about how to clear an allotment space if you've taken over an allotment and it's covered in weeds. And I think it goes absolutely in line with what you're saying. A lot of people say, can't I use an old carpet? Wouldn't that be the same? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, as long as it is a really old carpet that was made before the age of plastic. I have done that myself. Someone gave me a 1945 Axminster wool carpet. Yes. And beautifully, that worked really beautifully. And mm. also, I, I managed to move it around twice. So I, I marched an area, killed an area of weeds using it, then moved it onto another area. Uh, but then the third time I went to move it, it all fell apart in my hands. <laughs> and it was full of worms. Ah. Yeah, they really like wool. Because that was the <clears throat> natural fibre, wasn't it? Totally. Nowadays, carpets are not only ah. not natural, but also probably have sorts of chemicals in yeah, them. Yeah, they're treated. Yeah, things. exactly. So and just don't. Really don't want that. I really recommend not to go there. No. But there is a lot of brown cardboard. Now I'm not saying for one minute that cardboard is a perfect product in terms of. I well, don't it does know. blow away if you're not careful. I also think it's like the glues that are in there and things. And I don't really know. It's a very hard thing to find out on the internet exactly what goes into making cardboard. But I'm only recommending that you you need to use it once. It's not like every year. Yes. It's just so useful for that yes. piece of thick brown cardboard. Okay, so Charles, let's get a little bit more technical. We've learnt the basics of how of no dig and how it works. But as you alluded to, there is a fascinating soil life that's doing the work for you, that's releasing the nutrients to mm. the plant roots. Mm-hmm. Perhaps you can explain that to our listeners, this wonderful microbial life that's happening in the soil. Yeah, well, I first of all, just say that if anyone wants to find the, uh, this in depth, go to the website of Elaine Ingham and her work on what she calls the soil food web. And what I understand is what I've gleaned from her and interpreting that in the light of what I see happening in my garden. The, the, for me, the fungi are one of the key things, the fungal networks. And back in the 80s, it was thought that vegetables didn't use fungal networks to grow. It was only considered to be trees and bushes. But now it's realised that actually most plants do. And it seems to be that the fungi are in the soil. They've got a thread, a web of, of their, the mycelial threads. And they team up with plant roots because fungi can't feed on their own. They need to get food from what are called root exudates. And that comes from photosynthesis. So you've got that vital interlinkage going on all the time that collaboration between roots and fungal networks because the roots can team up literally physically join in some way the fungal network and communicate that they need certain foods and certain moisture as well and so the fungal threads can already got a network so the way i understand it is new roots of a plant that you've transplanted or sown and got growing just need to tap into it and that, I think, is why no dig works so well. Ah, OK. So the fungal network, when, when you say fungi, it's very tempting to think of little mushrooms underground, but it's much <laughs> finer. They're much filaments, aren't they? Yeah, like cobwebs. And but, the filaments are yeah. feeding off the starches, the carbohydrates from the roots. Isn't that right? But in mm-hmm. return, they're providing the liquid, the moisture, the nutrients. It's an exchange, know, isn't it, between and, the And, and the I think also these, the um, this feeding has happened with com- more complex compounds. It's not like pure even pure nitrates maybe you know it might be bound up in all sorts of things and i think that's probably where you're getting better nutrition because the roots have access to to you know the whole range of elements basically it's all there waiting but the beauty of it is is that the nutrients are not in soluble form so they're not being leached out or washed away by rain like here i put my compost on in november december mainly because that's when we're taking final harvest and that is preserving all that fungal network there but the nutrients in the compost it's not like they're washed out by rain that's um, very interesting because that's a very common perception yeah, again that's why i mention it exactly because <laughs> i you know I, I that's why i like questions actually for on social media because it, i can tell by what people are asking what they've been led to believe and yes. i just don't agree with a lot of it it's, it's you know i would say some of this comes from the fertilizer industry to be honest the nutrients from that compost were leaching out there's no way my growth would be so good but i'm i can do two crops a year it's also scale because I think a lot of the organic principles are taken from farming organic okay, principles. Yeah. And if a farmer puts down, say, a load of manure mm. in the autumn and the winter rains, there's a 
always the theory that the winter rains will wash the nutrients away. I don't Is think that so. I would say two scale, things about that. you have contained beds where it's not going to wash away necessarily. No, no, no? I don't agree at all because um, the rain is still washing through all the compost that I put on. I mean, you use the word manure, which is interesting because, you know, that's that's a real bogey word. What, what what does anyone understand by manure? I'll bet you every listener has got a different understanding of that word listening to it now. Mm-hmm. And and I, any farmer or gardener should be using composted manure and not putting on fresh because that's where you would get some leaching of nutrients. But, but the farmer probably wouldn't be putting it on no-till soil. Most farmers are still ploughing, cultivating. And I don't think that the soil structure... Uh, well, not any structure, but the sort of life in the soil is so good at holding on. Say some of those nutrients did leach out a bit, but they're going to be held in the soil if you've got all that network of life yes, preserved. Yes. And I don't think any of the studies on leaching, or at least I'm not aware of any that have been done with no dig or no till. So I keep getting it quoted back to me that, you know, all this leaching, oh, you know, it's been measured, but hang on a minute, what are the parameters? Yes. Cloud ground or whatever. Yes. Oh, that's very interesting. I mean, I, I feel that's where science can deal us a bad hand sometimes because it, it's not always made clear what all the parameters, you know, it sounds and it sounds scientific. <laughs> they have all these measurements. But. but it's also science, as you say, that's led by industry. Yeah. And that's what organic finds over and over again because right. it, it's big money behind industry. Yeah. And science is only as good as the questions it asks. Totally. That's so true. And we're little money. Yes. If any. <laughs> yes, exactly. So yeah. a lot of it is done by experience. And what I like is that as an advocate of this process, you write about it, you you, mm-hmm. you, you hold courses, people can mm-hmm. come and learn about it. Yeah, yeah and, and I think what people can relate to is that it is based on experience. You know, I'm not pontificating on yes. theory. I'll, I'll give the theory as I understand it. And I think it's very important to have at least some understanding of of the essence of what you're doing and why it works. And yes. I really concentrate on that. But yes. a lot of it is about practical details. Yes, that's true. And I think that's very much where Garden Organic comes from. I mean, we've been trialling no dig since the early, very early 60s, which is possibly before you and I picked up a spade, let alone put down one. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, again, through the membership and trying and experimenting with no dig, that Garden Organic is, is an advocate of it. But I think there are certain provisos and... Whether they're right or not, I leave that to the individual and their individual growing circumstances to advise. Now, I read an interesting sentence in your book, and I have to say your book is fantastic, No Dig Organic Home and Garden, which you wrote with Stephanie Hafferty. But you wrote the sentence, in your comparison beds, total yields were similar initially, but actually the quality was intriguingly different of mm-hmm. the produce from the no-dig bed. Yeah. Can you expand on that? Yeah, such a difficult word though, isn't it? Quality. Yes. Yes. I mean, what's quality to one person is not to another. <laughs> I'm guessing perhaps taste or texture? Or yeah, it, it was actually more um, texture and appearance. Like the leaves, are, I find them, look more glossy and lush and, and rich and abundant. And on the dig bed, they're more matte. Flavour, we don't really notice much difference. We we tried these tests and um, once actually the potatoes did taste better on the dig bed, I must acknowledge. And another time the carrots tasted better on the no dig bed. So it's like, it's a hard one to be precise about that. But the, the, the standout difference is the yield, which interestingly, uh, in the first six years, it wasn't hugely different. It was always a little bit more on the no dig bed. But in year seven and year eight, the no dig bed has been 15% ahead. Yes. of the dig bed which has fallen away a bit. So just to recap, mm. it's not so much the fact that you're putting added nutrients into the soil. It's more about building up that soil life so that the nutrients can travel to the plant roots. Yeah, that's a good summary. And you put on your compost throughout the year or just only in the autumn or only in the spring? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, I, my aim is always to keep it simple. I find it quickest and easiest to put it on once in the autumn Late autumn, just because that's when we're clearing. And then that's for the whole year. So I'm not putting on any more in the summer, even though when we're doing second plantings, because it's summer, you just haven't got time really to do that kind of thing. So summer is all about sowing, planting, picking, not much weeding. And then we twist out plants to clear the bed. I like it. the way you say you twist out plants, presumably mm. because the soil is such good structure. You don't need uh, to dig out a leak. Or... Well, no, exactly. I'm, I'm, and I'm always looking, thinking, you know, leave as many roots in as possible because that's food for microbes. Yes, and so also twisting disturbs the soil less. So that rotation, it snaps off the main roots and leaves most of the fine roots in the ground. Have you suffered from any persistent diseases or have you had experience of 
the glass, the ghastly club route, or in my case, I had the allium leaf miner last autumn. Have you ah, had experience well that, of that? Just on the leaf miner, I mean, that, that, would you, you wouldn't class that as a soil. Well, I know that the pest lives in the soil. Oh, OK. And so yeah, I know I that I'm that not <laughs> going to be putting my leeks back in next year or even for right. the next two or three years in that particular patch. Yeah, my enough. hope is that if I move to another, I have raised yeah. beds as well, yeah. that it hasn't travelled to the other beds. But I know that pest will stay there. Yeah. In my previous garden, I had some allium uh, white rock. And, yes. And that's a very persistent soil fungus. It's one of the few bad fungi. Most fungi are good. Yeah. And I found four years um, was enough. I, I was able to grow leeks and onions in that bed without it reappearing. And I think no dig helps because just in a very practical terms, if you've got um, a soil problem like that, or say club root, and you, you're digging it, and then it, bits of it are on your fork, you know, you're spreading it around. Yes. So at least with no dig, it's keeping it contained, and you know exactly where it is. All I can say here is, here, after eight years, I so far haven't got any club root. I haven't seen anything actually like that at all. Right. I think the rotation angle is is fascinating. I change where I'm planting, where I'm growing things round and about. I tend to do it because, and having been blasted by the allium leaf miner, I now mm. recognise the value of it. Mm. Well, yes and no, because I mean, it is, as well as feeding it, as you said, it's about pests and disease. Yeah. The other thing about rotation theory is that I don't think it takes enough account of the fact that most vegetables grow in half a year. And it's, yes. it's always talked in year terms, and then people scratch their heads after they've harvested their carrots in early July. You know, what do I grow next? <laughs> ah, well, then they need to go to the Garden Organic website, because <laughs> we've got there the half yearly one. So mm-hmm. when you've taken out your summer right. harvest, you know what to put in in the autumn. Mm-hmm. The other thing, Charles, which I'm sure lots of people ask you, is if you're putting down a whole load of damp manure or compost and as well as a mulch layer like old wool or cardboard, don't the slugs love it? Aren't you creating a slug haven? Well, the the description, the terms you use there, most of that would be applying in year one. And so say you're starting out and you've got a, a lot of weeds or whatever, grass, there will be, for sure. As night follows day, there's going to be a, quite a high population of slugs there. And so, like when I moved here, for example, I started out early 2013, and we just followed that really wet summer of 2012. There was a high population of slugs here, so I know all about that. You've just got to get through it. And year one can be difficult for that. But I think with no dig, from what I observe, in the end you get less, because I think you're not disturbing the slug predators, like beetles, for example. You know, every kind of cultivation is damaging the soil ecology. So with no dig, you're leaving all that intact and you're enabling a balance to be found. In nature, it it doesn't happen that something gets completely eliminated. If there were no slugs, there couldn't be any predators of slugs, you know, so you've got to have a few. (laughs) Um, But we found here remarkably little damage, actually, in the long run. But in that first year, when, as you say, you can get a lot, um, I'd go out with a torch at night and a knife or whatever your favorite method is <laughs> or slug pubs with beer you know there are many ways of dealing with them but yes. i would i would really emphasize that with no dig you are, are, i reckon you get a lot less and actually the anecdotal reports we hear of people on allotments and they they talk about people on the neighboring allotment just putting down slug pellets and they're saying well we don't need them yeah <laughs> there's just no damage or very little but in that first year when you're putting down mm. the bulk of it just hold your nerve yeah Totally. And and, then... and and do a do a foray at night with a head torch or whatever. You know? Yes, yes. You know, it's always amazing actually to go out at, at night with a torch. It's what you see. Another one I found once was sl- wood lice mounding on some leaves that were... It was watermelon plant actually and I think it was mainly because it was out of its climatic zone and really struggling. And I, you do, I didn't see them in the day but they're all there at night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh well, when we're tucked up in bed. Yeah. All sorts of things go on outside. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What would you say is the biggest challenge that you faced with no dig? Um, persuading or getting people to understand it. <laughs> <laughs> and the simplicity of it as well. I feel that gardening has been made really complicated. I mean, one of our heroes, J. Arthur Bauer, you must know who I mean. Yes. A lovely guy in Lincolnshire who was no dig flower grower in the 1940s and 50s. Mm. One of his quotes really sticks in my mind. He said, plants need air, moisture and light to grow. Why has it been made so complicated? And he then recited a whole list of, you know, NPK and all the chemical nutrients and feeds and temperature conditions. And pH is another one and so on. Just making it sound, particularly as the beginner, like, oh, God, this is so much to learn here. I can't possibly do this. And it's really very simple. I mean, I think for 
List some listeners. The big one will be getting hold of enough compost. And, that, and that's what I'm very keen to address by saying scale down, grow smaller. Use whatever amount you've got in a smaller area because you'll get more value from it that way. You'll save time and you will be surprised how much you can grow. <laughs> Charles, you're an organic grower. Of course you are. And I can see you're surrounded by wonderful Somerset countryside. I would have thought, therefore, that wildlife is important to you. Are there any particular things that you do to either encourage or share your space with that wildlife? Yeah, well, it's very interesting word, wildlife, because I would say in the organic world, one of the most important bits of wildlife is what's in the soil. And that links to what we've been saying. So Absolutely. no dig for me is the starting point. If you want to encourage wildlife, you, you need the wildlife in your soil. Um, beyond that, obviously, what we see on top, um, I love to grow flowers with my vegetables. I don't like weeds. I know that some people say that's an, a useful part of wildlife in the garden, but it's a very difficult one to manage if you want to be time efficient with your growing because weeds don't respect boundaries and they'll very quickly either go to seed or spread out new roots like with cooch grass and bindweeds. So that's why I'm passionately saying keep your growing space weed, weed free. But I dot around with flowers in the summer things like french marigold nasturtiums um escoltia california poppy snapdragons uh linum i love them all you know just small ones though not monster plants but i do grow a few sunflowers so bringing flowers in helps you've got a broader mixture of plants dotted around the garden you're going to get a a better balance of of different pest and predator if you like all through your space depending how big it is and organic gardening you first started as an organic gardener or how did that come into your life yeah i was passionate about that when I began because I read this book when I was at university about animal rights like Australian professor called Peter Stringer he got me interested in nutrition and actually I became vegetarian in 1980 which was a little bit tricky in those days there wasn't much catering for vegetarians yes I was the same um, but anyway that we led me on to cranks and we ate at cranks well yeah because we were cranks <laughs> that's quite right yeah and I was eating like a rabbit as my father kept saying so what I got then got interested in was n- nutrition and, and reading that led me to organic and and I grew up on a farm using chemicals and I started to question that and not only the chemical contamination of food but also whether the, the nutritional quality was in there uh, particularly from using fertilizers that's a it hasn't been really addressed enough I don't think you know they're, they're weakening the nutrient profile and so um, yeah I joined the Soil Association in 1980 and then helped to get the organic growers association on the map i went i was licensed um, by the soil association grow through the 80s and interestingly in that time i was no dig from the beginning but i wasn't really talking about it the soil wasn't on the map as a subject in even for the soil association in the 1980s because we had jeff hamilton come down with gardener's world in 1988 and looking back on that yeah i didn't really think about it at the time but it was all about the organic bit because jeff was really getting into organic and mm. wanted to get it out there and show people how possible it was And so the whole programme was about organic. We didn't cover no dig. Oh, that's interesting. So that you were doing intuitively, or based on what you'd read, but you didn't think it was something that necessarily needed to be talked about? Yeah, I would say really more intuitive. Obviously, Ruth Stack gave me the starting point, and some of these old writings about no dig that you've mentioned, and the Soil Association were doing a bit of it. Yes. But more in the 50s, I had access through a neighbour, Mary Langman, lovely old woman, who had been, one, again, one of the founders of the Soil Association. She was in her 80s at the time. And she'd also worked with the Peckham experiment. Have you heard of that one? No, I haven't. Tell me. Oh, God, that's such an interesting one. There was a, a centre started in the 1930s by two doctors who were fascinated to find out more about the nutrition of their patients and how that could help to reduce disease. It was a bit like the alternative way of looking at disease, encouraging health looking at health as a positive rather than at disease as the negative that needs sorting out. And they had great success, and it's just a shame World War II put a, an end to that one. But Mary Langman, who'd worked with, with all of that, and, and she gave me some of the old Soil Association magazines, 1950s Mother Earth, it was called. Lovely name. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the bits about no digging there. So I kind of I knew about it, and I, I could see how good it was. And I couldn't work out why did it then kind of disappear off the map in the 70s and 80s when I was doing it. So I wasn't, like I said, there wasn't much interest, but I just did it. It just yes. seemed right. And I wasn't getting many weeds. Charles, I know you're a busy man because of all your growing, and I can see that. That's testament round here. But you also lecture, you hold courses to spread the word about no-dig techniques. What do you do when you're not growing, when you're (laughs) not doing all this work? Uh, Well, increasingly little, actually. (laughs) How does he relax? Um, I'm a bell ringer, actually. I do campanology. Oh, yes. Ringing the church bells. Here in the village. In the neighbouring town of Bruton, mm-hmm. uh, they've got six heavy bells, which I really enjoy because it's a good weight to pull. You can really get into it. My other hobby is is not 
It's related to growing. It's weather. I'm just fascinated by weather. I always have been. I've got weather records going back 50 years nearly. You know, that just ties in so much. I'm always keeping an eye on the weather and yes. what happens yes. next. So that links also to this fascination with climate now. And you, I also read that you plant by the lunar calendar. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite into biodynamics and all that kind of thing without being proved biodynamic or anything like that. I'm really interested in what I call energy gardening or farming. You know, the, the work of Victor Schauberger, this Austrian guy who yes. developed copper tools, for example. I use copper tools. I think there's so much more to find out about yes. all of these things. And we can, if we're not careful, get in a dangerous place with it in that a lot of it's what modern science still can't measure. And this is where I would appeal to any scientist listening to this to open up that parameter a bit because things get called cranky if they can't be measured or superstitious. Yes. And that's not really fair. You know, it's just because actually we, we, we don't know about them yet and we haven't been able to quantify them. And so those kinds of things really interest me. And I do use the biodynamic preparation hormone 500 um, here and I do sow and plant by the moon when I can. <laughs> Often you can't because you're doing something else. Mm. Uh, but yeah, th- those are fascinating leads to explore. I think it's the difference between the Eastern and Western philosophy. The Eastern, mm-hmm. the Western philosophy is it only happens if we can prove that it does. Mm, right. Whereas the Eastern approach is, well, of course it happens. And if you want to prove it, then fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice summary, yeah. yeah. Um, I-, I feel in the organic world that we've been too much backed into a corner by science. And I've noticed that organic growers, particularly market gardeners, God, do they talk about nutrients a lot and, you know, NPK and all this kind of thing. They sound like a fertiliser packet sometimes. And that is not right because, like I was saying, back in the 80s, the Soil Association was not talking a lot about soil. I feel that they've allowed themselves to be... Maybe they feel the need to speak the language so that they well, get heard rather than appearing as cranks. Exactly. That's exactly it. But the result of that is that you, you need to keep always in mind that, that it makes you... You're talking their language all the time. And that means you can't open up these new horizons which are so interesting and so valid I would say and, and a classic example of that is the use of words you know the way that chemical farmers using synthetic fertilizers and poison sprays have allowed to appropriate the word conventional yes I agree entirely oh well I'm so pleased to hear that but you see I hear all the organic farmers and growers using that word conventional farms do this yeah no they're not conventional organic is the conventional yeah. the other is agrochemical exactly and that's how I always refer to them brilliant let's keep it that one <laughs> But, it, you know, it's, it's got ingrained and it's got it's become a habit. And so that makes them seem normal, which they're not. Using poisons on the land is not normal or natural. And mm-hmm. as you said, it should be agrochemical. So if, again, for any listeners, <laughs> go for it. Let's change these words. <laughs> I and love it, that we're in agreement on that. Well, on that light also, you know, it's, it seems really unfair that organic farmers and gardeners have to get certified, for a better word. You know, you have to get approved and pay £500 a year or whatever to be called organic. It should be the other guys having to pay that to use their poisons. I think the argument always is that it gives consumer confidence that they know that they're Oh, yeah, I, I, I get that. But it's just the way the whole thing is really set up against these, these wonderful natural practices. Charles, what I'd really love is if you could walk me round the homemakers in the growing plot. But the weather is very British and very inclement. And I think the listeners won't hear a word because of the wind. Mm. So we get a good view of it here. Can we start over here on my left? There's a small patch here that's that looks interesting that's what i call my small garden and i've done a lot of youtube videos about that four or five times a year to show the viewer how we're cropping it how we're planting interplanting clearing replanting uh, to get an idea of what can follow what is 25 square meters 270 square feet and it's three beds each one has just got a one inch covering of compost that's gone on in the last few months this is february and there's still some things growing like spinach kale spring onions rocket a few carrots still in the ground lamb's lettuce which i interplanted between swedes there's a clump of chives on the end and there's some leeks still so it looks fantastic yes yeah. exactly yes which, there's 12 different vegetables growing at any one time yes and moving round from there we're now getting to some larger beds um some of these you're growing for produce to sell as you mentioned yeah. earlier but some of them are trial beds aren't they talk me through some of the trials yeah well um the main trial beds are in the middle and that's the dig no dig trial and that's the only two beds here which have wooden sides and i keep the wooden sides on them just to delineate so that it's more easy to see on work precisely and they're 1.5 by 5 meters so that's 5 feet by 16 feet do you plant them up exactly the same totally yeah they, they everything's the same so the same amount of compost in each the dig bed though i dig the compost in traditional to one spit roughly which is about eight 
inches, 20 centimeters. Yeah, I'm starting to do first sowings now. I transplant most things because that increases the rate of growth. And then um, we'll be clearing in through June and early July and replanting for the autumn. Okay, that's interesting. Just scroll back. So you do most of your sowings under control, indoors or in the greenhouse or whatever. Yeah, I find that so much more efficient. And although you need a space for it, obviously a dedicated space, um, I would urge anyone who's got a bit of the space to do it and um, to invest in that because it can increase your output so much. Yes. And right the way through the year, I'm, I'm sowing and planting until the end of September pretty much and you don't need a large greenhouse to do it you can do it indoors if you've got light windowsill or whatever yeah or even use artificial lights I mean, I've never done that but I'm reading more and more people who are doing them the LED lights they don't use too much electricity so that's definitely an option worth considering and I actually do germinate a lot of my seeds in here in the house because you've got higher nighttime temperature than the greenhouse that's very true so for the first week they're in here germinating then once they need light I take them out of the greenhouse and I must say also that in the middle of the garden and right in the middle is my composting area yes. and it's there for that reason that because it's, it's so central to everything going on here and, and in any garden really it's efficient time-wise to have it in the middle because then you, you you spend a lot more time taking stuff to it than you do spreading it out and but it, it makes it accessible and it's also quite attractive thank you very much for your time i feel i've learned a lot and i'm sure the listeners have as well thank you Don't forget to subscribe to our organic gardening podcasts. Every month we have a new guest, plus helpful tips and advice on how to grow the organic way. Bye for now.